I wish I had the ability just now to bring you face to face with the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is as definitely a person as God the Father is a person. The Holy Spirit is as surely a person as Jesus, the Son of God, is a person. He is more than just an influence. He is more than just one of the attributes. And I would like in the next few minutes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to make his person real to you. It would change your whole outlook on life. He can change your relationship with Jesus. When you realize the power of this wonderful third person of Trinity, it opens up the entire word of God to you. You see everything so differently. And then you realize how valuable is this experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I believe in that experience with every atom of my being. The Bible teaches it. There is an experience after one has been born again. First comes the new birth experience. That experience that we call conversion. Being born again. Regeneration. When one accepts Jesus as one's personal Savior. After that, there is an experience that's promised to every believer. The experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit. Call the experience anything that you want to. But it's a part of every Christian's inheritance. And it's a part of the plan of Jesus for his own and every member of his church. Now for just a few minutes, I want you to see the word of God as God relates to the Holy Spirit. Oh, this is something that's very glorious. The word of God clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit relates himself to both God the Father and to the Son. Turn, if you will, please, to the third chapter of Matthew. Begin with the 16th verse. And immediately you will recall that glorious event when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism. Oh, these two verses are very revealing. I still contend that the full depth of the meaning of these two verses cannot be understood by any human being. It's also involved, and yet it's so simple that even a child can understand. For here we have all three persons. You know it well. You have read the 16th and 17th verses of the third chapter of Matthew many times. I shall read it again. But I pray that the Holy Spirit himself shall give you a clearer revelation than you've ever had before of that which has happened. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out to the water. Now get the picture. Here we have the person of Jesus, who literally is God in the flesh. For you will remember that the clearest revelation that God ever gave of himself, he gave through his son, Jesus. 
And Jesus literally was God in the flesh as he came and walked upon this earth. So here we have Jesus. When he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And this is what he saw. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. That was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the Word of God teaches, is the Spirit of God. This is vitally important. I pray that the Holy Spirit himself shall give you this glorious revelation as to just who he actually is. Whenever you think of the Holy Spirit, whenever you speak of the Holy Spirit, remember he is the Spirit of God. And whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you read of the Spirit of God, it was the Spirit Spirit of God that moved upon the waters during the time of creation. It refers to the Holy Spirit. Whenever the Old Testament prophets spoke of the Spirit of God, they were always referring to the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. All right? Here we have Jesus coming up out of the waters of baptism. The heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And remember, it was the same Holy Spirit, the same Spirit of God that came in that upper room as the 120 tarried and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased No man, no woman can ever come before the throne of God. No person in the day of judgment can ever plead ignorance regarding the fact that he did not know that Jesus was the true Messiah. That he did not know who Jesus really was. For God himself made sure that all generations to come would know that the one who came in the form of flesh, the one who came up out of the waters of baptism, was all that he said that he was and that he had been sent by God himself and that he was the very son of the living God the true Messiah. God did not leave that for an angel. He did not leave that for another. But God himself spoke and proclaimed to all generations to follow, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And there you have all three members of the Trinity. Jesus, coming up out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God Himself, but the person of Almighty God was still in heaven. That's so 
simple, so profound that the greatest minds that have ever lived have never been able to fathom the full depth of it, and yet it's so simple anyone can understand. And it gives full proof as to just who the Holy Spirit is and how he relates to the Father, how he relates to Almighty God. He is the Spirit of God. And you know, the most amazing thing is that we think we know so much about the Holy Spirit. And there are those who feel as though he is just a new personality having come on the scene. And that it was something given just to the church. I marvel at how much the Old Testament prophets knew regarding this third person of Trinity, the Spirit of God. I marvel at the knowledge of Jeremiah. It's not to my might. It's not to my power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. The Holy Spirit. All the Old Testament saints, many of them, were well acquainted with the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit. Here's Isaiah. And remember, he's the same Holy Spirit today as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that Isaiah knew. That 61st chapter of Isaiah, and this is so thrilling, Isaiah describing his experience when he said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. As I stand in the pulpit, and I feel that wonderful anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I feel sorry, for that one who has been called to preach the gospel who has never known of that wonderful anointing, let me ask you, as you stood there in that pulpit, has that anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon you to such a degree that you are not conscious of those who filled the pews, that literally, he took those lips of clay. I'm not talking about speaking in an unknown tongue. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit taking your mind and giving you the mind of Christ, giving you the mind of God. And literally, as you surrender yourself to Him, you are hearing with your own ears that which the Holy Spirit is giving to those to whom you are ministering. There's nothing in the whole world like the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Nothing. Nothing. If you're a man of God and you stand before your people as the great shepherd of the flock, and you've been given the responsibility to preach the gospel. Your greatest thrill is to stand and have every fiber of your being under the control of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. I do not have the vocabulary. It is not in the human vocabulary to describe these 
things of the spirit. They're so marvelous. And here Isaiah had the same wonderful anointing. To me, that's glorious. I know those of us who have experienced the wonderful Pentecostal experience sometimes feel as though we're the only people whom the Lord has so blessed. And that this is something new, a new thing that has been given to a precious few. Oh, bless you. I say I knew the same Holy Spirit. He's talking about that same anointing that you and I have today. And he looks up with great joy and cries forth, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. John had that wonderful experience on the Isle of Patmos. And he knew not how better to describe it than to say, I was in the Spirit on the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. There's something about that that's so strangely precious. Again, I remind you, as we're coming face to face with the person of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you listen very closely and realize that the Holy Spirit is a person that you and I cannot take lightly. We dare not. There's something about the Holy Spirit that is very Solemn, sacred. He is one easily grieved. Those words were never spoken of God the Father or of Jesus Christ the Son, but of the Holy Spirit. He is not a person that you can just cast aside, put behind the door shrug your shoulders and say, I have no need of him. When you consider that the sin for which there is no forgiveness is not against the great creator, is not against almighty God, that's the thing I so marvel at. And the Bible clearly teaches that there is a person against whom you can sin. And there is no forgiveness for that one who sins against that person. No matter what you say about God, you use his name in vain. You have You have refused to come to him, to call upon him. And yet, the very moment, then in all sincerity, you look up and accept his son as your personal savior, just automatically, he adopts. You may be the worst sinner in the whole world. You may have committed every sin there is. And yet, when you accept his son, the Christ, as your savior, he adopts you as his child. He makes you his heir. And you become a joint heir with Jesus. 
no. The sin for which there is no forgiveness is not against God. Neither is it against Jesus the Son. Even those who spat upon him. While the spittle was running down his body. Had they turned and cried out and said, Forgive me. I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. Even in that moment, Jesus would have looked down and said, I forgive you. As he cried out and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The sin for which there is no forgiveness is not against Jesus the Son. That sin is committed against the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. Not since the early church has there been so much excitement regarding the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can recall the scriptures regarding the great excitement. After Jesus went away, he had told them the Holy Spirit would come, this mighty third person, the Trinity. And as always, he came just as Jesus said that he would come. And there was great excitement on the day of Pentecost. Oh, it was glorious as 120 waited in the upper room, and he came. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. What excitement! And there's always excitement wherever you find the Holy Spirit, this wonderful third person of Trinity. There was great excitement in the early church as hundreds were filled with this wonderful third person of Trinity. And again, there's great excitement regarding the Holy Ghost. Not just among a few, but it's worldwide. You'll find it in Catholicism. You'll find it among the Protestants. You'll find it around the world. Many are being filled with the Holy Spirit. And remember, this mighty third person, as Jesus said, is with every believer, but there comes a time in the life of the believer when he is not only with the believer, but literally he fills the believer with power, power for service. Well, today for just a few minutes, I'm going to speak to you regarding this wonderful third person of the Trinity in relation to the healing of a sick body. Probably you'll understand the person of the Holy Spirit a little better after I explain his work. Perhaps you'll understand his part in the healing of sick bodies. As I try to explain the Holy Spirit as he works in these great miracle services. Now remember something, before I begin talking about this wonderful third person of the Trinity, never forget that the one who is all important is Jesus Christ, the great high priest, the very son of the living God. Never lose sight of Jesus. Even in these wonderful miracle services, when I talk about the great Holy Spirit and the great moving of the unseen power, and you feel the glorious presence of the Holy Spirit, for His presence is in the earth this very hour. His presence is here. Jesus, this hour, is in position of great high priest, the right hand of God the Father. But the per it's the greatest power in the world today. I have reason, I have cause to say to you that I believe in miracles. Even though I do not understand these miracles. 
Who can understand God? Who can understand the power of God? Who can fully fathom the one who spoke the worlds into existence, who spoke the planets into existence? Who can analyze the one who said, let there be light? Who can understand the working of the Holy Spirit? There's one who understood, and that one was Jesus. That's the reason before he ever came. Before Jesus ever took upon himself the form of flesh. Before he ever offered himself to God to be given. Before he ever came to earth in the form of man, as much man as though he were not God, he offered himself through the Holy Spirit to be given because he knew that as man, in the form of man, as much man as though he were not God, he could not perform these miracles in himself. It was one of the greatest revelations that he ever gave to me. He had to put complete trust. He had to put his complete confidence in the Holy Spirit, this great resurrection power. Everything depended upon the Holy Spirit. He knew the power of the Holy Ghost. And that was the reason one day he turned to those who were questioning him. He turned to his adversaries. He turned to the skeptics and said, if you won't believe that I am all that I say that I am, then believe me for the very work's sake. You see these miracles. You see the marvelous manifestation of the divine. And the power and the person to whom he was referring was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a new person just having come on the scene. Know that. The Old Testament saints knew the power of the Holy Spirit. You talk about the manifestation of the miraculous in the life of Gideon, in the life of Samson. The miraculous in the life of Joseph. What was it? Nothing more or less than the power of the Holy Spirit. David knew the power of the great third person of Trinity. That is the reason he cried out, Take not of thy Holy Spirit from me. You can take everything I have, David said. But I know wherein lies my power. I know wherein lies the secret of the supernatural is in the Holy Spirit. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. May I please somehow, the best that I know how, and somehow I feel that I fall so far short in trying to explain these things to you. I've looked up more than once and I've said, Oh, Heavenly Father, forgive me for my inability, please, for not being able to tell it better, please. And I want so very much to explain something to you. And I don't know how to get it across. I have 
nothing to do with these miracles that people are talking about. I have no healing virtue. And yet people are talking about the miracles. And I too stand there amazed. When a man and his son walk up, as that man walked up on the stage of the Shrine Auditorium in his son in ash and white, a son, a high school teacher in Southern California, Speechless when he said it's true. My father for years had these large tumors on his face. As large as walnuts. And just sitting here in the service today, just sitting here, just a few minutes ago. My dad put his hand up to his face. And he discovered the tumors were gone. They're not there. What's the answer? What's the answer to these folks who are being healed by the power of God, the healing of cancers? Arthritis. What is the answer? It's the same person in whom Jesus had confidence, complete confidence. And there's nothing quite so thrilling as the Word of God. And here's the secret. Jesus understood. He knew. That was the reason. Before he ever came, he offered himself through the Holy Spirit to be given. If there would be miracles, Jesus knew he did not, as mere man, in the form of flesh, have the power to perform these miracles. No man can perform miracles. Know that. takes the power of the supernatural. Jesus understood in the 10th chapter of Acts, the 38th verse, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Wherein did lie the secret? Jesus was the instrument, but it was the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, through him who did the healing. The Word of God says so. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And there were miracles. The same thing has happened today. No wonder there's so much excitement regarding the Holy Spirit. No wonder there are thousands upon thousands who are witnessing this great power. It's not just limited to this ministry. Know that. Please believe me. This is the day of special power. Because the Holy Spirit knows that he's going away. This glorious dispensation of the Holy Spirit, as surely as the dispensation of Jesus Christ the Son, came to an end. And Jesus went back to the Father from whence he came. So surely one of these days we're coming to the end of the close of the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit knows that he is about to leave. The word of prophecy is being fulfilled and God is doing a special thing in these days. It's an hour of grace. It's an hour of mercy. This great excitement that's permeating the very atmosphere, this great excitement, this glorious day again where millions are believing in miracles and seeing the manifestation of this great power, the moving of this great person upon the earth, the Holy Spirit. Shall 
you sat there in the auditorium and you felt that warm glow going through that body of yours. It was his power. Jesus understood and knew. As you felt like bolts of electricity going through that body of yours. It was his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. As you're sitting there now, there's something that's happening to you and you don't understand it. I don't fully understand it, but I know that it's as real as the person of God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen the wind? No, no man has seen the wind. But you and I see the result of the wind. We see the result of that great force caused by the wind. No man hath seen the Holy Spirit, this mighty third person of the Trinity. I've never seen him. You have never seen him. But through these great miracles, this great unseen supernatural force in the healing of these sick bodies, in his glorious slaying power, again, we're seeing the result of the great unseen force, the power of the Holy Ghost. And as long as he's still here with us, we'll continue to see miracles. with all of my heart. You've heard me say it over and over and over again. Never forget it. But always remember why I believe in miracles. It's because I believe in God. And there'll come a time, I don't care who you are, whether you're poor, or whether you've been blessed with this world's goods, it makes no difference what your nationality may be. Sooner or later, if you are a part of humanity, you're going to need a miracle from God in your life. And when you need that miracle, he'll be there. Today, I'm going to talk about a person who means everything in the world to me. <laughs> I'm absolutely dependent upon the person of whom I'm going to talk about. The wonderful third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And I want you to get acquainted with this personality. He is a person. Millions are talking about the Holy Spirit. And there are just as many ideas regarding this wonderful third person of the Trinity. But remember something, he's more than just an influence. He's more than just spirit. The Holy Spirit is a definite personality. It's my firm conviction that no one can have a true knowledge of this wonderful personality until he indwells the heart, the vessel, the body of an individual. I believe that with every atom of my being. I know the Holy Spirit who's in the earth 
is the one who sends mighty conviction to the individual before he's born again. Remember that all conviction, if you have any conviction whatsoever of your sins of the judgment to come, it's the Holy Spirit who's the mighty convicting power of the Trinity. This wonderful personality is with every believer. If you've been born again, if you've had this wonderful new birth experience, this experience that we call regeneration, salvation, the Holy Spirit is with you. He's with every Christian. But there is an experience, a glorious experience, where He is not only with you, but the word of God says, and he shall be in you. And no Christian, no individual, can really know what the person of the Holy Spirit is like. You do not have a true knowledge of his personality until after you've had that wonderful experience of the Holy Spirit abiding within. I want so very much in these next few minutes to tell you what he's really like. I know I shall fail utterly, for no human vocabulary could ever begin to tell you what this wonderful person is like, this wonderful, colorful personality. I know I'll fail, but if I can just help a little bit, because he means so much to me. He is the secret of the power in my life. He's the secret of this ministry. First of all, the Word of God says, as many as are led by the Spirit. We see from the word that he leads, he guides. And if he leads, then we follow. I think of it so very often. So many of God's children have gotten the idea that they can lead the Holy Spirit. And that's when we get into all of our difficulties and all of our troubles. I've seen them over and over and over again, trying to use the Holy Spirit, trying to lead the Holy Spirit. It was one of the greatest days of my life. It was one of the greatest of all knowledge that has been given to me. When I learned the secret of allowing him to lead, to guide, and I learned to follow. If I were to tell you it was easy, it isn't easy, but it's one of the greatest secrets that a Christian can learn. I follow him so closely. In the great miracle services, you'll never know. There can be 7,000 people out there, or maybe just 50. And yet, there's one person I'm constantly conscious of. There's one personality that I'm very conscious of. I follow him. I follow him so closely. He leads. As he leads, in his very presence, and that great unseen force settles upon a great auditorium filled with people. That great unseen personality 
as real as the air. As great a force as the greatest force of the wind that has ever blown, and yet no man has ever seen the wind. That great power, that great personality moving upon men and women, and I follow him so closely as he leaves. I wait for his leading. Learn that secret. If you're not sure, wait for him to guide you. The Bible teaches that this wonderful, great personality of the Holy Spirit also intercedes for you and for me. Let me ask you something. How can any one of God's precious children go down in defeat when we have at the great right hand of God the Father, when in position of great high priest, the very Son of the living God, and living to make intercession? How can you live one moment of your life in defeat when you have the great high priest interceding for you, the very Son of the living God every moment of your life, night and day, but more than that, you have this personality, the Holy Spirit, the mighty power of the Trinity, who will intercede for you that you might know the perfect will of God. And sometimes I think the hardest thing in the world is to know the perfect will of God. Let me read something that's precious. Oh, it's so precious. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself will make the intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of God. Oh, to know what is in the mind of God. How often I've sought to know what is in the mind of God. Don't stop there. The Spirit, the Spirit, knoweth what is in the mind of God. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I dare say there isn't a single one of us, but what sometime in our life we've come to the place where we have not known the will of God. We've come to a crossroad. Only one decision that we make is in the perfect will of God. I've been in that position, so have you. And God has a perfect will. I believe that. This very moment, God has a perfect will for you. God has a perfect will in my life. In making decisions, it must be made in the perfect will of God, and yet we're human, and we come to the place where we seek His will. We know not what His will is. You ask me, what do we do under those circumstances? Wait. Just wait upon Him. Do nothing but wait when you're not sure. And as you wait, the Holy Spirit will make intercession for you, knowing the perfect will of God. But remember something, you can only know His perfect will 
and he'll only make intercession for you before the Father's throne, seeking the will of God in your behalf when you get to the place where you have no will of your own. And sometimes I think that's the hardest, the most difficult thing in the world. I have a will separate and apart from the will of God. You, as an individual, have a will separate and apart from the will of the Father. Jesus, the form of flesh, had a will separate and apart from the will of his Father. But remember that great experience in the life of the Son of the living God. Before he could die on the cross and pay the price for man's redemption, he too had to get to the place where he could look up and say, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The very Son of the living God had to surrender His will to the will of the Father and the two wills became as one. Do you know what I'm trying to say? It isn't easy to tell you. I only know within. I only know through spiritual revelation. But there comes a time in our life when we love him enough. We love him so completely that we look up and say, not two wills, your will and my will, but one will and I surrender my will to His will. And then it's impossible to miss the will of God. There's something else. This wonderful personality, you must have Him. You can't live your life without Him. You can't, you can't live a full life without Him. Remember something else. His spirit will bear witness with your spirit. And we're living in an hour of great deception. The Bible teaches in the closing moments of this dispensation, there's great deception in the world. As surely as there's a genuine, there's always a counterfeit. But his spirit will bear witness with your spirit. His In this hour of great deception, wait, be sure that His Spirit bears witness with your Spirit. Ah.
but there's more. There's more. There's something I want to give you today. I pray you'll never forget. Maybe it means so much to me because they're lonely hours. Times of loneliness. Times when I feel very much alone. I feel so alone sometimes. But I have this glorious promise that this comforter, the one who knows the will of God, the one whom I follow, the one who leads, the one who intercedes. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will be there to defend me. I don't have to fight my own battles. Oh, there was a great day. There was a time in my life when I had to fight my own battles and I felt as though I had to fight God's battles for him, you know. <laughs> it was just like that. But the hour came and I realized I didn't have to fight my own battles. He was there to defend me. When the enemy would come in like a flood, I was not standing alone. I could lift up my head. I could square my shoulders. I could stand straight and face the whole world knowing in whom I had my confidence my trust the Holy Spirit was there to defend me you'll never stand alone never you don't have to fight your own battles not for a second. The Holy Spirit, this glorious personality, will be there. The unseen personality will be there to defend you. And you can depend on him for victory. And you know before I ever say it, I believe in miracles. And miracles happen every day. As long as God hears and answers prayer, there will always be miracles. 
Remember that. And you and I believe in miracles because we believe in God and in the power of prayer. Today, I'm not going to have any guests. I'm just going to talk to you. I hope that you'll have your Bibles out and that somehow I can make Jesus a little more real to you. You've heard about these wonderful miracles and yet the greatest need in that life of yours is for the spiritual healing, the great spiritual touch. Many of you folk know that Dr. Freiling is the pastor of the First Covenant Church in Minneapolis, a very marvelous church, a very conservative church. And Dr. Freiling was one of the pastors of Minneapolis who uh, cooperated with us when we were there in a service recently. And Dr. Freiling was sitting on the platform with other pastors. And during that great service, the power of God began falling all over the arena. Oh, it was thrilling. If you've been to one of the services, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And um, just as naturally, it was just the most beautiful thing. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit descended upon Dr. Freiling, this very conservative pastor. And, uh, <laughs> It was something that you cannot describe. There are no words in the human vocabulary to describe these spiritual experiences. Well, it was three or four days after this beautiful spiritual experience that I received this personal letter from Dr. Freiling. And uh, I want to just share with you one paragraph of a personal letter that he wrote to me. People from my congregation and fellow pastors have asked me about the experience of coming under the power of the Holy Spirit as you touched me. To which I can say that it was very simple and beautiful. It was, in fact, the most normal, unsensational spiritual feeling. And far from being, as some might imagine, extremely different from every other proper spiritual manifestation, it seemed rather to bring together and to harmonize in that moment all the beauties and the charms which the Holy Spirit had previously given. To be under the Spirit's anointing is truly a normal state. All else is abnormal. And this comes from the pastor, perhaps, one of the most conservative churches in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the pastor of the First Covenant Church. And so today, for just a very few minutes, we're just going to speak about the wonderful person of the Holy Spirit. I've discovered something recently, and that is the fact that it, it's marvelous to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Remember something, the Holy Spirit is a person, not just one of the attributes, not just an influence. The Holy Spirit is as definitely a person as Jesus, the Son of God, is a person. As God is a person with a very definite personality. And we see the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. As you come into these miracle services, we're awed as we see simple manifestations of the power of God and the healing of sick bodies. You thrill to it. It's supernatural. That's the reason you do not need Catherine Kuhlman to lay hands on you, pray for you. That's the reason it's so marvelous that folk are sitting there in the services or 
instantly healed by this great unseen power, this great unseen person. That's thrilling. It's thrilling to see the manifestation of his power as people are slain by the power of the Holy Ghost. Call it whatever you will. The slaying power. I'm always amused when <laughs> those who know nothing about the Holy Spirit will use the modern term. They were zapped. <laughs> oh, I think that's the very first time in my whole life I've ever used that term. But it's, it's probably a modern term. But I don't know how better to describe it than to just say they are slain by the power of God. It's the Holy Spirit. I don't understand it. Do you really think that I understand how it is that a great big man, 200, 225 pounds, standing there and then suddenly in just a split second, his body is lying prostrate on the floor. I had nothing to do with it. Believe me, I tell you the truth. I have not one thing to do with the slaying power of the Holy Spirit, and I do stand there odd. I can't give you an explanation except for the fact that perhaps these old physical bodies of ours are not geared for so much power. Maybe that's the reason before we can stand and see God face to face. For the Word of God says that no man hath seen God. Before we can stand in His holy presence, this which is mortal must put on immortality. This which is corruption must put on incorruption because he's a holy God. And these mortal bodies of ours can stand in the presence of such holiness. These physical bodies that are open to sickness and sin. This physical, this corruption just isn't geared for God's holiness and geared for so much power. But when we stand in his glorious presence after the old heart has taken its last beat, we'll have resurrected bodies, new bodies, glorious bodies. Oh, that's thrilling. It's marvelous to see the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. And I believe in the gifts of the Spirit with all of my heart. And to see these gifts being manifested. But that's not what I want to talk about today, not really. I believe that there are literally thousands and thousands
very limited, almost nil. It's because, you see, I'm busy doing the master's work. But there is a fellowship that I know that is greater than any human fellowship that any human being has ever known. There's a closeness. There is a communion with him that's the most priceless thing that I have in this life of mine. Paul knew it. That's the reason he spoke of that communion. And the word of God speaks of this fellowship like this. As many as are led of the Spirit. And there are thousands today professing the power of the Holy Spirit, professing the fullness of the Holy Spirit, who know practically nothing about this being led of the Spirit. And remember something, when you're being led, you follow. You do not do the leading. Do you really know what it means to be led of the Spirit? To follow Him, there's a closeness. I tell you the truth, you say to me, how can it be in the Spirit, Miss Kuman? How can it be in the great service when you call out a healing away up in the balcony and there are thousands there and you can't even see in that top row of the balcony and yet you sense, you know, the Holy Spirit bears witness to that one's healing. No, my friend, it is not ESP, and I beg of you, please, do not label it as ESP. I know nothing about ESP whatsoever. I've never read a book. I've never read anything regarding ESP. I know something that is greater. I know the person. I know the power. I follow him. I am led of him. And I become so sensitive to him. Totally unaware of the throngs out there. I'm only conscious of the leading of the Spirit. As many as are led of the Spirit. But there are thousands who are trying to lead to the Spirit. And that's the reason you get out of the will of God. That's why you've gone off into fanaticism. That's the reason you do such unsightly and unseemly things. That's the reason that you bring such reproach sometimes on something that's so beautiful and so marvelous. That's the reason there are such manifestations in the flesh instead of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a person or a power that you and I can use. The Holy Spirit must always use the vessel, the surrendered vessel. Then I want you to see something else so marvelous. When you really know the person of the Holy Spirit. I believe that there's a time in every life, I don't care who you are, I don't care how steeply spiritual you may be, when you do not know the perfect will of God, when you do not know how to pray. As a woman said to me the other day, I had entered a shop. And she confided in me. <laughs> and she said, you know, We've just found out my mother has cancer, and I don't know how to pray. I don't know whether to pray that God will take her because it's his time to take her, or whether to pray for a healing for a physical body. Or perhaps you have come to the edge of your Red Sea and you do not know just how to pray. It's most difficult sometimes. 
but remember something. There is one who knows the perfect will of God, the one whose perfect wisdom, the one whose perfect knowledge, and when you get the place and you do not know how to pray, and you're spiritual enough, when you come to that point of surrender, where you have surrendered your will to the will of God, and two wills become one will. I'm telling you something that you may not need tomorrow or the day after, but as surely as you are part of humanity, you're going to need the very thing that I'm saying to you this very hour. When you can get to the place where you have no will of your own in a given matter, and you have completely yielded the will in that matter, to his will. And two wills become as one, his will. And you leave the matter completely to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. He will intercede for you. He'll come before the throne of God and pray with you and through you and in you. And you cannot miss the will of God. God, I promise you. Do you know the Holy Spirit in that prayer life of yours? Where you do not fight against the will of God, but where you yield yourself to His will. There's more, my friend, when it comes to the mighty third person of Trinity, than the manifestation of his power, than the, the gifts of the Spirit, more than the healing of the physical. There is a communion, there's a fellowship, the one who takes the loneliness out of your life. You can trust him. Jesus trusted him. And he knew him better than I've ever known him. And I feel that if Jesus Surely I can trust him. I can trust him to lead me. I can trust him to guide me. I can trust the presence him of God to protect is me. not just a theory. It's a fact. Years and years ago, and it's been a long time ago when I first started out in the ministry, I I started my ministry in the state of Idaho. <laughs> oh, my young inexperience. My whole life before me, everything was wonderful, such a challenge. In reality, really never having had a real heartbreak, a real honest to goodness heartache. Oh, sure, I knew what it was to be hungry. I knew what it was to sleep in a turkey house. <laughs> Once I slept in a straw stack, just because I knew I'd been called to preach. For at least a week, I lived on butter horns. At that time, they were just five cent rolls. And loved it. Oh, I loved it. But all I could preach about was just a new birth experience. It was all that I knew. I had no knowledge regarding the Word of God except the knowledge of having been born again. I had had that wonderful experience. I had been born again. Jesus had come into my heart. And you can't give to someone else any more than what you have experienced yourself. First sermon I ever preached. You'll never believe it. I preached on Zacchaeus up a tree. 
And the Lord knows if anybody was up a tree, I sure was. <laughs> but I was full of my subject. Oh, when I believed the Bible, I didn't know too much uh, concerning that which was in the Bible, but I believed the Bible. And every time I would have finished a sermon, I think, my goodness, life, there isn't anything else to preach about. I've exhausted the supply. And I'd walk out of the little Presbyterian church, or walk out of the little Methodist church thinking, what did I preach on tomorrow night? I have exhausted the word of God. There's nothing more left to preach on. Then each time I think, where? That hour when the night is so dark there's not a star in your sky but I promise you something his presence will be there with you just as surely as his presence is with you when the Sun is shining in all of its glory I want to read a familiar portion of the Word of God one that has meant so much to me in fact in most of my Bibles, it's, it's worn a little thin. I've read it so often. And it's something that happened to Elisha. And I still say, this is one of the greatest compliments that was ever paid a human being. When the king of Syria sent out his whole army to get just two men, Elisha and his servant. 
sweeter compliment could be paid. <laughs> Watch it. I read it to you. It's in the sixth chapter of Second Kings. And he said, go and spy where he is. Go after Elisha. His whole army now going out after one of God's precious servants. That I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he to the horses and chariots and a great host. Just get this picture. Just get this picture. The king of Syria sending his entire army after Elisha and his servant and said, go after them. He sent horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and they compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and this is a thrilling pot, and host encompassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, unto Elisha, Alas, master, what shall we do? Here's Elisha's servant scared to death. I have visualized this over and over again. This poor servant, shaking. He was so frightened. He said, Elisha, my goodness alive, look! We don't have a ghost of a chance to win. We don't have the slightest chance of getting on top of this thing. We're defeated before we ever start. Don't you see the enemy arrayed against us? They've got horses, they've got chariots, and in the natural, he was right. Here was an entire army against two men. That's all. And he answered, this is what? The man of God answered, for he saw God. He didn't see the enemy. He took his eyes off a serpent. The enemy didn't frighten him one bit. And he answered, fear not. Don't be afraid. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed. And I'd give anything in the world right now if I could pray that prayer. The little mother who said, for whom the night is so long, that someone who knows you and you feel so alone, I'd give anything in the world if somehow, in a very simple way, I could say for you, wonderful Jesus, do for that precious one what Elisha did for his servant. And this was the simple prayer that he prayed. I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. And God grant the prayer. And this is what he saw. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. If right now, this very moment, in your hour of despondency, in your hour of darkness, If only you could see the chariots of fire round about you, the strong arms of the master underneath all of the uncertainties of life. You are not alone. Can't you understand? And I pray that somehow the Holy Spirit will make it real to your heart. 
Can't you understand, beloved? He doesn't leave you in the eleventh hour. You're so certain of his presence when there's no sun. When the sun is shining in all of its majestic splendor. When there's laughter and there's gaiety. And it's so easy to pray. And it's so easy to believe. And it's so easy to have faith. You feel so secure in him, and you're sure of his presence. But beloved, he's with you when the night is so dark. You can't see the shining stars. And you awaken in the middle of that night, almost afraid, as frightened as a little child. There may be sickness. There may be a broken heart. You are not alone. He never leaves you in the eleventh hour. He hasn't left you now. If only your eyes could be opened and you could see. One day he said to Abraham, and Abraham said, but where? Go, Abraham, and I'll be with you. Go, Moses, but where? Where, Lord? Go. But I can't see. I can't see one step of you don't have to. Go. The word of God says, obedience is greater than sacrifice. And all that you have to do is to be obedient unto him. You don't have to understand. That was one of the greatest lessons that I have had to learn in my life. I don't have to understand it is my business to be obedient unto him. And if I am obedient unto him, obedient to his voice, obedient to his word, he'll be with me. Had Moses known that one day he would stand at the very brink of the Red Sea? Would never have dare to have responded to the word of the Lord. He was obedient when God said, go. And when he stood at the very brink of the Red Sea, God parted those waters as though it was molten glass rolled about. And the children of Israel were led through dry land. See, sir, something else that happened in the life of Elijah, and this has always been most thrilling to me. And again, you see, this glorious thing of obedience, that's your part. Don't worry about God. Don't worry about the lack of his presence. You be obedient unto him. What he tells you to do, do it. Nothing happened to Elijah. But here's the secret. Before the miracle ever took place, there was obedience, first of all, on the part of Elijah. And he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. I know immediately something's going to happen. I know immediately there'll be victory. Immediately, no matter what the future would hold for Elijah. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning. And bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Because there'd been no rain in the land. And again the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. 
He'll not leave his own in the eleventh hour, I promise you. I give you his word. If you are obedient, he'll not let you down. As long as Elijah was obedient unto God, God provided. He said, all right, it's time now for you to go. But I have prepared a little widow woman. But I have provided you with this little woman, and she'll take care of your needs. You go. And when he came, behold, the widow woman was there, just as the Lord said, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a care. I am only a poor widow woman. I am not rich. Water I can bring thee, but a morsel of bread? That little widow woman was the most unlikely person in the whole world for God to use to supply the need of a poor, hungry preacher. Elijah. She said, that's all I have. I only have a morsel of bread. Mm -hmm. And just a handful of meal in a barrel. And just a little oil in the cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks now that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die because we have only enough for one meal. That's all. Just enough food for my son and myself for one meal. And after we will have eaten this one meal, we'll starve to death. There's no more left. And yet you come and ask me for something to eat. Now, in the natural, this was the most unlikely thing in the world. But never underestimate the power of God when you are obedient to his word. Oh, I read this a thousand times. I love it. It's thrilling. And I pray it shall mean as much to you as it has meant to me through the years. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me therefore a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. Here comes obedience. Obedience that is greater than sacrifice. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat not one day, not two days, but many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. You can stake your very life on the word of God. And it came to pass that after these things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto him, Elisha, what have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? What? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him on his own bed. 
And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, what a simple prayer. Hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by saying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come unto him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came unto him again, and he revived. And Elijah the prophet brought him down out of the chamber into the house, delivered him unto his mother, and Elijah said, See, my son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is This is God's word. Is it dark? If he knows it. Are you afraid? Are you full of anxiety? Your first duty is to be obedient unto him. You may not be able to see, but I promise you, underneath are those everlasting arms. Underneath of those everlasting arms. His presence is as real to you this very moment as the hour that you sit at his glory.